Here's Michael Caine, chairman of Booker McConnell. Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the main purpose of the evening, and it gives me great pleasure to call upon Norman St. John Stevers to announce the winner of the 1985 Booker Prize. Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, this is a great literary occasion here in the Guild Hall tonight where we are all assembled for the award of what is, thanks to Booker McConnell, the most valuable and also the most prestigious literary prize in Britain. And when I have made the announcement of the winner, Mr. Michael Caine will hand over the cheque to the winning author. As Mae West uh, once said, God is love, but get it in writing. <laughs> One should not drop names, as Her Majesty the Queen said to me only the other week. <laughs> but uh, tonight, I have had to turn down two Prime Ministers, our own and that of Hungary, who are dining at number 10. When I asked the Prime Minister for permission to be absent, I told her that I would be lynched if I didn't turn up here an intelligence which he received with remarkable equanimity. <laughs> but she said, oh, it's an important occasion, Norman, off you go. The judges have had a fiendishly difficult task going through 103 novels. And this afternoon, we had to consider a short list of six, any one of which is worthy of carrying off the crowd. How envious we felt of Mr. Disraeli, who, when he was asked by a lady whether he had read George Eliot's Middlemarch, replied, Madam, when I want to read a novel, I write one. <laughs> May I remind you what this prize is for? It is not for being top of the pot. It is not for providing a riveting yarn or an easy read, though the winner may, in fact, do that too. It is for a major and serious contribution to contemporary English fiction. All our magnificent six do that. I take them now, in order, but you are warned to attach no significance to the order in which they come. First, there's a splendid book from Australia, Illiwaka, Australian A Tall Storyteller by Peter Carey. It's a masterpiece of storytelling, vivid, varied, compassionate, funny, a novel in the tradition of Smollett and Stern, a portrait painting of the heart. But it's long. Some might say too long. As it was. <laughs> then there's The Battle of Pollock Crossing by E.L. Carr. It's beautifully constructed and vividly written. Like all great novels, it has the consecrating power. But it's short. Some might say, too short. <laughs> but it has its economy, its control, and its balance won. We shall know the answer in a few moments from now. The third book on my list is The Good Terrorist by Doris Lessing. This Lessing has returned from outer space uh, with her genius intact. Her book discharges a major function of art. It shows us what is going on in the society in which we live. It's powerful, but has it hypnotized the judges? Time alone will tell. Fourth is another book from the Commonwealth, this time from New Zealand, The Bone People by Kerry Hume. It's a highly poetic book filled with striking imagery and insights. Three characters fascinate and intrigue. It seems to be only about child battering, but it's rarely about love. Is its theme too disturbing, or is it a winner? Fifth, I come to The Good Apprentice by Iris Murdoch. Miss Murdoch is one of contemporary literature's brightest stars. In this deeply moral book, she deals scintillating with some of the great themes of human existence. Guilt, forgiveness, redemption. She's on top four 
with her 22nd novel. She's already won the Booker once. Has she made history and carried it off a second time? We shall see. Six, I come to Last Letters from Hard by Jan Morris, who has written some of the finest travel books of our time, including a spark plug about Venice. In this short book, with its evocative and moving picture of the beautiful but doomed city of Hall, she has distilled the essence of her experiences. She has fulfilled Matthew Arnold's imperative with regard to a work of art. She has instructed and she has entertained and she has done more than that. She has extended the frontiers of fiction. But has she grabbed the book up? I'll tell you in 60 seconds. That rarely is what you want to know. So I'll cease to babble and reveal the truth. The Booker Prize, like British politics, is half a crusade and half a sporting event. And the book which has carried off the double laurels is... The Bone People by Kerry Hughes. Well, Kerry Hume was a well-tipped outsider. Uh, not the boast of her, obviously, but I tipped her myself at TVA this morning. She can't be here tonight, so her prize is being collected by Marion Evans of the Spiral Collective, the feminist publishing house in New Zealand, which first published The Burn People. And they're going up for the prize, singing a Maori song, I think. in America lecturing at the moment and we've just managed to contact her in Salt Lake City on the phone. Here she is now talking to Hermione Lee. Hello, Kerry Hume. Hello, Kerry Hume. Kerry Hume, yeah, yes. Hello, congratulations on winning the 1985 Booker Prize. We're very sorry that you can't be with us tonight. Are you pleased? You are pulling my leg, aren't you? No, it's true. You have won the Booker Prize. Bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> what is, apart from bloody hell, what is your first reaction? Are you pleased uh, that as a New Zealander? Totally unbelievable. Are you pleased that as a New Zealander you have won this prize? Exceptionally pleased, because this must mean in some, some larger way that New Zealand lives to get to look in elsewhere than in New Zealand. Yes, quite. Do you think that it's a, an extraordinary thing that you've sort of penetrated the heart of the British literary establishment in this way? My goodness, yes. For, a, for an amateur book that sort of um, was, was put together over a long period of time and then was published by, by a dedicated group of women yes. who had on that published other books and it hadn't sort of gone, gone for anything as ambitious as this. It's amazing. Your friends are here tonight uh, and it seems to be a book which is very much written with your friends and comes out of your uh, relationship with the collective of workers. Uh, is that true? Yes. Uh, 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 I, I always maintain that without Spiral Collective, without Marianne Evans and Miriana Evans and Eddie Huppert T. Ramson, there wouldn't be any book. Yes. Uh, are you right working on something now? Yes, I'm uh, working on another novel which is tentatively titled Bait, which is, um, to put it pretentiously, about death. Does, does it like the bone people come out of your own experience and your own place where you live? In a way. Bone People does not actually come out of my experience. It's, it's, it's really completely fiction. 
um, bait and dust. Good. Well, congratulations again. And I'm sorry to have taken you so unawares with this splendid piece of news. <laughs> you have certainly taken me unawares. And you're sitting in the middle of Salt Lake City. I am, and I hope I'll for the shirt. Well done, and thank you. Goodbye, Perry Hume. And now I'll return you to Melbourne Bragg. So that's Hermione Lee on the phone to Salt Lake City and Kerry Hume's delighted friend sitting there at the table. The Booker Prize has been won to repeat by Kerry Hume. That's all from us, though. We hope to be here next year with our host, Booker McConnell. Until then, from this Book for special, good night. Well, that's a great day for Kerry Hume and for New Zealand writers, too. For us, we're back with Kaleidoscope, the program that should have happened tonight, but didn't for the best of all possible reasons. Join us then. We have a profile of Dean Buchanan, and we have Subculture. That's part three of Art for All. See you then. Good night.